Derek Cobbs, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. Um, so how, I mean, how have then things been through this sort of pandemic for you? Um, I think it's been uh, eye-opening because, you know, it's given me a lot more time to just work on things better myself uh listen to other music practice other music um become a better producer and engineer um and just learning different techniques and different plugins and different sounds and just really take a step back from regular life which has been like touring for the past you know seven to eight years so it's a chance to get healthy chance mm. to learn about finances chance to talk to my family more chance yeah. to exercise more like it's stuff like that real life stuff um mm. and just even really even get more spiritually sound and all of that man it's it's basically just taking this time to work on everything else yeah that's that's uh i think that's the healthy response to that question it is uh it has been an opportunity to take a step back and you know develop some new skills and maybe get a little more you know deep a little deeper in in things that maybe have been neglected yeah. you know i like the thing about health you know uh you know working out working on yourself spiritually all of that stuff is um is good stuff and and unfortunately with the way that things tend to be especially for a pro musician there's not a lot of time to do that stuff. I mean, you're just kind of running around just trying to, you, you have to say yes to everything, you know, because uh, you're trying to pay bills, you know, and, and also because you don't want a no to be the harbinger <laughs> of, of no gigs. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Cause that is a thing. Um, I, I used to sort of labor over that quite a bit because there would be a number of gigs that I, I don't really want to do. <laughs> but I would say yes to because I didn't want people to get the idea that I didn't want to play. And, um, you know, and when you're dependent on that for income, I mean, you got to you kind of have to. <laughs> well, I don't really want to play with this cat, but. I'm going to take this gig. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough because, like, not all money is good money. But right. um, some of them you just, you have a feeling like, okay, this one will help me. I don't know how or who or you never know who you're going to meet or right, all of right, that. Right. But it's just like this gig will help and I, I need to do it. Um, yeah. But some of them, you're right, though. Some of them you just got to say no. Like, it's just, it's not good for you. <laughs> So. I remember I did this uh, uh, Tyga Graham. Um, you you you, the, you may recognize that name from uh, what, what, what's the name of that band? What was it? Silk. Oh yeah. <laughs> so he was lead vocalist for that band, and so he he did a gig in Kalamazoo, and. This was when I was working at, I was still working at CLC. And, uh, you know, the, I, I knew that the, you know, I knew the Silk stuff was going to be kind of, you know, I knew, I, you know, it's, it's R&B. It's, it's baby, take your clothes off R&B. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what it is. And, but, you know, I was like in the, in the horn section. So I was like, you know, hopefully in, <laughs> <laughs> if it gets too crazy, hopefully not that many people see me. Um, I, actually, I, I honestly I didn't really care that that wasn't a big deal. Wait, was that the gig or was that the play? Huh? Because he did a musical too, like a little play, like a stage. Oh uh, no, it wasn't a it wasn't a musical. This was a gig. It was oh. it was an outside gig. Wow. And. Uh, yeah, and so this dude was turning up, 
and he was doing all kind of crazy stuff. He had he was he was uh, bringing women up on stage and stuff. He was doing all kind of he was going. It was way extra. OK, way extra. And but, you know, I it's Tiger Graham. I was like, it seems like this might be a good a good thing for me to do. Um, plus the, this uh, promoter, this gig promoter that I had been working with it was kind of his thing and so he was like hey you know can you can you you know can you do this thing so i was like okay <laughs> and i just remember trying to hide my face and stuff like okay <laughs> i'm like oh. oh my gosh it was one of those gigs and all of us have done those you know a couple of those gigs when it's like ah. Uh... <laughs> I guess I'll take the money, but <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. I didn't know he actually had a show there. I remember he did a musical mm. at uh, at Shannery, and it was like me and Cliff. It's funny because oh. I I think I was still in high school. It was oh. either middle school or high school. I was playing like key bass and like mm -mm. I mean everything was just so rent and we were in a pit too so it was just like okay okay so you if, so you could kind of hide yeah if anything <laughs> went wrong I, I i think there was a couple songs where i actually played like electric bass and i can't even play bass that well but it was just like we ain't getting paid that much so like i'm gonna go for it <laughs> so yeah those are interesting times i didn't know he had a separate show too that's hilarious uh and th something that's you know that's pretty common about cats that you know they have a name you, the assumption is that the band is getting broken off but we know <laughs> that that ain't that ain't necessarily the case and maybe more often than not you know the band is struggling they you know they're they're scraping and and whoever the lead artist is you know they're taking the lion's share, you know. Yeah. There's a lot of that kind of goofiness in, in the business. I'm sure you yeah. have a lot of experiences with that, with certain artists that really compensate well and others that it's like you have to, like, double check how much they're going to pay before you say yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting because it's like, no matter how much you practice and no matter how good you are and no matter how much facility or chops or licks you have, it's like you are only as good as you negotiate. Um, oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like a lot of times, I guess there has to be a difference between like if the artist is independent or if they're actually signed to a label or whatever, because a lot of times they don't even know how much you're getting paid. They just know you're there. So yes. you can't when you when it goes time to discuss money and, and finances and stuff like you can't even take it personal on the artist because it's like they think everything is good so right. but you really have to know you have to know your worth and it's it is a battle sometimes because it's like you get on a gig and you might have negotiated but it's not as much as you want it and then you show up to rehearsal and there's a bunch of food and drinks and people partying and spending money on crazy stuff for like wardrobe and stage is crazy or they'll have a bunch of lights and LED walls. And it's like, oh, that's where the rest of our salary went. Oh, to right. The wall, <laughs> to the screen. And it's just like, man, it's just, you just sometimes you got to be willing to walk away and yeah. just be like, okay, this, they don't value me. And if you can, if you can afford to do that, it, it, it feels good. So, I don't know, it's a give and take, but I, I've been fortunate to most of the time, the business is, is pretty decent. So, um, so we have a lot of history. Absolutely. Yeah, we got a lot of history. So, uh, we played at the same church, Christian Life Center. Uh, Pastor Joel A. Brooks, that's him. That's him back there. Um, and uh, that was episode 36. This is episode 123. Phew. Yeah, that's uh, moving right along. This has been... A Thank you so much 
for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. It's been a really, you were talking about like, uh, with, with extra time, you know, having some more time to do other things. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly what I tried to do with this podcast. It's something I wanted to do, uh, for a while, but it's not something I ever had time to do. And then let alone being able to interview the kind of people that I want to interview, which mm -hmm. are, you know, as busy as I am and you know probably not available in the in the in the windows of time that you know uh that i've carved out um you know uh typically the reason that i interview at the time that i do at the times that i do is because my son is in bed sleeping he's seven <laughs> right because i'm not trying to create like some, an extra duty for my wife or something by me doing this i mean she's already um you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. So she's already kind of, you know, doing that. So, um, but you know, a lot of the folks that I've interviewed would not have been available. You, I mean, it's likely you, you would not have been available at this time. You've been somewhere, you know? Um, so it's been, you know, I guess there's somewhat of a silver lining with uh, everything going on. Uh, but we have a lot of history. So uh, Christian Life Center um, and, you know, so I show up there and there's this there's this kid, there's this little kid. And I'm like, what is this kid talking about? What what what's this about? You know, because everybody thinks that their kid is talented. You know what I'm talking about? Like everybody's like, oh, yeah, my little kid, he can he can he can play. And then you see them actually playing. You're like, right. <laughs> but uh, that was not the case with you, man. You you were a child prodigy um, all over the drums and, you know, playing keyboard and doing all this stuff. And uh, I was so impressed with you that I had you uh, uh, play with my band, my fusion band at uh, uh, District 211, which was a regular uh, reg regular place that I played at, uh, it was an important venue for live music, uh, in Kalamazoo. Um, and, uh, that was a fun gig and <laughs> we had a, we had a good time. I have a lot of fond memories of that band that, that, uh, we put together with the full horn section and all the keyboard players and, you know, guitar and and everything just the whole the whole ball of wax and uh i have very fond memories of that and with you guys you and cliff heavy heavy man yeah that was fun man so much fun um, so um so i'm trying to uh, i'm trying to place things so how long were you at CLC? Uh, were you still there when I left? Cause I I split after uh, a year was there. Okay, so I uh, uh, so let's see here. I took a full time position there in two thousand one, mm -hmm. and then by mid two thousand two or maybe two thousand three. Um. Uh, I took a position in Lansing, uh, Lansing school district, Lansing school district. So it would have been about mid 2002, the okay. 2003. So were you still at CLC at that time? Yeah, I was there until, uh, cause I graduated in, uh, 2008, summer 2008. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, so Doug Pierce, you, you, you work with Doug Pierce too then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually just did a live stream with him earlier today. Uh, on my Thunder's Thoughts show, and I interviewed him part of this series too. Um, and I think we talked about you. I'm, I'm sure we talked about you in his interview. Uh, but yeah, okay. And then after that, you went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. yeah, can you talk a little bit about your experience at Berkeley? Um, it was cool. Like first, just to test it out because I really didn't know what route I wanted to go to college wise because you know, I mean, I had seen like you and like Doug and Joe Ayub and Brett Farkas and all those guys and like uh, mm. even Jevin, Jevin Hunter. Um, yeah, Jevin and Gianna. Um, like it was like okay, Western is so intense, and like everybody I know that goes there is really good. And so, but it's like I didn't want to do something that's jazz focused, but I didn't want to do something that's just straight like funk fusion focused either. Like I still, the whole time I honestly wanted to be like a studio engineer. Like I wanted to learn mm. how to mix and. Uh-oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, they calling you for a gig. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but um, yeah, like Funk Fusion, and I, I really wanted to go for engineering and just really get like my ear tuned to like the actual technical side of engineering and like learning frequencies and you know, compressions and verbs and how to like run a console. And all. I was really into that because um, like in high school, I think I was either 13 or 14, my dad got me Pro Tools. And um, so I'm at home recording myself and, you know, it's cool and I'll like do the best that I can, but nobody really taught me. So I wanted to go get that side and still play, you know, and still gig. And it's, it's always been a dream of mine to tour. But I went to the Berkeley. They had a five-week um, performance program and went there and <clears throat> met, like, some of my best friends and people that I still work with to this day. And it was just interesting to see how, how just so many different walks of life people came from from all over the world to go there and play music. And um, it was weird because it was like, your peers were the ones who pushed you to get better. It wasn't like, oh, you have a teacher or instructor that's just, you know, just completely killing you every lesson. Like, okay, I need to get better because my, my teacher, I'm tired of my teacher just wearing me out. Like, it was just like, you go there and almost every kid was just dope. And I'm like, man, this is, it's, and it's people like me, like kids that grew up playing in church or, you know, mm. playing in their jazz bands or their orchestras or singing and all this stuff. And they're producing and they're writing and they're working on records. And some of them had already been signed artists. Some of them had toured already. And um, and even then at that time, a lot of like R&B and pop people, like they were getting gigs after leaving that school. So I'm yeah. like, okay. And I just wanted to get out of Kalamazoo too. Like, and I get that. Yeah. Cause I, I didn't know anything else. I mean, I knew because my cousins had toured as well, but like, it was just like, there's nothing here and I don't want to get stuck. <laughs> um, so yeah, Berkeley was a great outlet. I ended up going there fall of 2008 and, um, it was interesting because right during that time, that's like when like four on the floor pop music got really big. So like mm -hmm. the Katy Perry's, the Lady Gaga, all those people. And like a lot of touring acts weren't even using live bands at the time. Like it was just backing tracks and singers and dancers. And it's like, well, I can't dance. Like, what am I going to do with this? So, um, it was interesting around that time to see how the industry and how music was evolving and changing. And, you know, no style of popular music lasts forever. Like it'll come back, but nothing is permanent. So like just trying to, it's weird, like trying to figure out where, I, where I'll fit in music. Mm. Um, Cause it's like, I don't want to just, you know, play at clubs and bars or weddings. And it's easy to get to, especially in Boston. Like, I mean, you put, you get in the wedding scene, you can make a good four hundred to eight hundred dollars a wedding, and it's like, cool. I'm gonna just put on a suit and play these 
play these top 40 songs for a few hours and, and my bills are paid. Um, but it was just like, I tried that a few times and it was really, it was really tough for me. Cause it's just like, nobody cares. Like people are just mm. drunk and dancing and having a good time. And which, I mean, it's a wedding as you should, but it's like, you know, certain families are like, they're like, I paid you. So they feel entitled. So it's like, you do it a good set. They want to hear a song again. You just got to play it again. So it's like mm. you're playing the same song three times and it's not even that great of a song. It's like, okay, I got to figure this out. Um, so that's one side of things, but the educational side, um, it was cool. I feel like they have a lot of different, um, a lot of different majors that you can choose from that will fit um, with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's not just like performance or composition or, or engineering. It's like, there's so many things that like they specialize in that can help you grow in whatever path you want to go in music. And I, I really appreciated that. But at the end of the day, like, it just became way too expensive. And mm. I had to drop out. So a, a very small percentage of the, especially folks that are as talented as you are, super small percentage of them graduate from that school. It's, it's almost like a networking hub. Um, you know, you, you go there to meet other folks that are do what you do and to get networked with other folks and then hopefully to sort of base, be able to start touring. And, yeah. um, um, and, uh, so, so, ba so backing up again, um, talk about your, your childhood in music when you started playing and, um, you, both of your parents are musicians. Yeah, both of my parents sing. Um, my dad plays a little bit of keys. Uh, but yeah, just in Kalamazoo my whole life. Um, my dad was a choir director, still is at times, but during that time he was directing choir, super heavy, and I was just always around it, just gospel music and soul music. And uh, they honestly didn't really have to force me to play. Like I started out on drums around like two years old. So they got me a little mini set and kept up with that. And then when I got bigger, I could play the bigger, the full size set. And then um, around four years old, my dad made me take uh, piano lessons. Um, and it was weird because I, I hated it. Like I didn't want, I just wanted to play drums. Like drums is so much fun. And he was just always like you, as long as you play drums and you can only play drums, you'll always need somebody to play with. You'll always need somebody to accompany yep. you. Yep. And um, that stuck with me even now. And is I I should probably be probably be thanking him every day for making me play keys because it's just it's gotten me so much further. Um but yeah, so I started doing that around four or five. And my mom was the, the director of the youth choir at CLC. And it's crazy because that's around like 1995, 96. My dad, they're both on the praise team and my dad's over the adult choir and my mom's over the youth. They didn't have a drummer back then. So it was just Pastor Brooks. It was, uh, what's the guy? Herb Thompson. And it was Roland Sunkins. That's and, right. Roland Sunkins. Yeah. That's right. So Roland would sing and play and they just had a drum machine and like Herb yep. had this big notebook of every BPM written down. It, it didn't even change the loop. Like it was just like, this is a set list. So it's going to be 125, <laughs> 179. Same loop. He just dialing it back. <laughs> oh, goodness. It was just like just one loop. I really... I really want to find that drum machine like on Craigslist or something. I just need to hear that loop because I, I haven't heard it since. But um, my, uh, the youth choir would play on, they would perform on second Sundays. So every second Sunday, I will bring my drum kit from home and play with the youth choir. So he did that for a good five, basically until you got there. Like, um, Charles yeah, Laster I, I, got hired, and then they got he. He yeah. made them get drunk. 
Yeah. So so uh, before the new building. Yeah. So Sunkins basically Sunkins. He didn't last through the transition getting into exactly. the new building basically. Yeah. And so I had I had arrived when we were still at the old you know at the old building doing three services on the same day and and all of that right um and everybody was so happy to to reduce from three services to two services on sunday right yeah um uh wednesday night service right uh yeah. but i just show, <clears throat> i showed up i showed up with my horn one time cuz um pastor brooks saw me somewhere or something and he and he said hey you know uh, why don't you come to church, you know, and bring your horn with you? So I brought my horn and I just came up and started playing during during one of the services. And yep, I remember that same thing. No drums. Roland had a drum machine. He was playing the bass in one hand. He was playing the keyboard mm -hmm. part in the other hand, and he was the main singer, right? So yep. he was doing the whole thing, right? Um, and then that sort of transition between that and what we did at at the new at the new building man was uh was crazy stuff because and i just i recently i interviewed raphael crawford uh, you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> wow i haven't seen him we in were, years yeah yeah we were talking about the whole thing too so we had a full horn section it was me uh raf and mark landis mm -hmm. trumpet mark landis and um and then when mark left that's when I hired Doug to come in. Um, uh, so he was already there prior to when I left. So then that was a good transition. He kind of moved into a position similar to what it was that I was doing. Um, but Joe Ayub, of course, um, uh, Jeremy Bieber, that was one of the guitar players, remember? Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other one you already said, Brett Farkas and... Um, Let's see here. Yeah, all of those guys. Oh, John Wirt came in. John, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he came in after. Uh, that's right. So all of those guys, those those were all Western guys. Um, and it's crazy because before all of that, Keith Hall was playing drums. So he, oh, got, yeah. he was playing before you got there and after. Oh. Because he had went to New York for a while and came back. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Call um, me again. So, um, yeah, so, so, <laughs> so I want to, okay, so, so we're going to, we're going to fast forward some, well, quite a bit. First, I want to ask you, now I already have my opinion of it, um, but I'm going to ask you your opinion of the weekend's uh All super bowl right, right. halftime show now I, I don't want you to lose any gigs man i, I you well, know i don't want you it's, to lose it's any not gigs. even about that i think it's more of like my the guys that were playing are my friends so, oh i see yeah but no we can talk about it for sure yeah um we can talk about it honestly i thought well first of all he didn't get a fair shot because we couldn't hear him I couldn't hear him. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if he did good or bad. Um, right. I thought it looked incredible, like the visual and the staging and all of that and the different camera angles they had. I, I thought that was really great. And I mean, that's just from, for me, just experience over time with dealing with so many different tours and programming shows and seeing what people do and just that it's sometimes the whole overall experience is bigger than music. Mm. Um, cause it's like a lot of people, we can put our all into the music and the common fan and viewer will never understand what we did. So right. you have to find a way to ease them in and sneak them into it. And, um, I think the weekend show, like I enjoyed it. I, I thought that it was, I mean, I don't think there were many musical risk, but like, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it just wasn't How musical. Very, risk. It's very Everything diplomatic. Is, it's, it's very diplomatic of you. Yeah, no, yeah. like it's it's serious. They played each song. They played it, and like it was big and it was energetic. But it's like that's just 
that's just what it was like yeah and, and like the songs the records are big like i honestly i still can't believe uh what's the song blinding blinding lights or whatever isn't uh nominated for a grammy because it was literally one of the biggest songs ever so right um so yeah it's a double-edged sword because like he's where he's been these past few albums he's been working with some of the biggest pop writers of all time so mm-hmm. it's it's a weird place to be because the lyrics are crazy um mm-hmm. but yeah i think i think they just you know it was it was safe and and they they did what they were asked to do it's like no matter how big you can make it it's like okay you play this or you're fired yeah yeah well the in the the thing is too is like we have to remember that this was during the pandemic right so obviously there's a bunch of restrictions that had to be in place you yeah. know um probably in and, and I'm, I'm imagining that there was probably some sort of mandatory quarantining prior to the prior to the you know to the show and then after the show and you're getting you tested know. every day right right and um so all right <laughs> so this this is what i thought um i was disappointed that th- there might, there was a couple times during the show where you could see a piece of a guitar player but other than that you really couldn't see the band mm. and so that always is like come on man you know that that i i didn't dig that um some of the staging and some of the whatever they were trying to to do it was it was it it came across as being a little bit too abstract uh like the sort of uh robot choir thing that they were trying to do it was Mm -hmm. a little abstract so it's it's almost like am i supposed to understand what the, what this is is are they is are they referencing referencing something with this or is it just or is it just like abstract you know and so well, some of that stuff was a little bit like okay <laughs> um but i mean i you know i thought he's he he sounded good you know however much of that was actually live how much of that vocals was actually live you know um he, I mean, he sounded good, and the song sounded like the recording. So that stuff is all was all positive. It was just a little weird. And the thing, like when he went, he goes in, and there's all the mirrors and stuff, and oh, then yeah. seems like the people start multiplying or whatever. That he goes out, and then the whole field is full of them. You know, I I understood what was what they were trying to get at. Um, I think that, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Well, about that though, the, I'm, I mean, I don't know what they were thinking in the process, but I know during the song with the robot choir, that song is featuring Daft Punk. So right. with that group, they're always wearing helmets and we still don't know what they look like. Okay. So maybe it was just a bigger version of that. And I mean, I, I definitely would have loved to see the band more. But what really bothered me the most was that, like, at the end when they played, uh, earned it, the song they did for Fifty Shades of Grey, the orchestra is all dancers. It's not even real string players. So, like, yeah. uh, like technique is all basically just mm, yeah, balling yeah. up a fist on the yep. on the neck and all of that. And it's like, why don't you just go higher? Just regular yeah. string play. Even if they're going to mind, like, just get real players. Like, yeah. But I guess it, it nobody's thinking about that. Yeah, you know, it's it, it actually bothers me. Uh, you know, you watch movies, and you know, I, I you know I, I I watch movies, and they'll have these you know scenes where it's like a wedding band or something, mm-hmm. um, and it's like it's the wrong saxophone. Like the recording is a tenor, and they've got an alto. I mean, I've seen stuff that was so terrible that was like the saxophone mouthpiece is upside down you know uh they got the wrong hand on top of the horn you know they, yeah. it's just all kind of just like really like 
this obscene like this stuff 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 that just <laughs> it's like dude do you guys care about details at all <laughs> yeah it makes you wonder like do they really just not know or did they do that on purpose just to be funny? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, it's I, that bad. Exactly, exactly. Maybe maybe that maybe this is like an inside joke or something. Um but you see it so often that it, it just seems to me that whoever the person is that does the consulting for the band, it, it's like they just have a lack of people that know what they're doing and or the, okay, they they may be trying to save money. Right. So they got somebody doing it that shouldn't be doing it. Um, or that person is unwilling to act, like act, actually ask the questions, you know, you know, it, it happens all the time. It'll be because it looks good. Right. They'll have an acoustic bass player up there, probably playing with the wrong hand or something. They have an acoustic ba bass player playing up there. But on the recording, it's an electric bass. Yeah, it's like, come on, man. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's Hollywood. It's the the look is everything. I mean, they're starting to care more now recently. I mean, especially with like the movie Soul and all of that. Like, they got real mm. people and they really mimic the the people's hand movements and all that with the animation, yep. which is crazy because I've never seen that before. But um, yeah, it's, that was, I think it's starting that was, to it's starting to be more. There's a more there's more awareness now. So hopefully that will be consistent. Okay. So I have to tell you, um, the Justin Timberlake Super Bowl halftime show a few years ago, that was one of the best ones I've seen. Oh, wow. And yeah, I mean, uh, everything was great about it. Of course, the band is a big part of his show, right? He's got, he's, he's like interacting with the band and stuff. So that's, that's his thing. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I guess you, you had something to do with that music. I did. Why don't, why don't you talk about that? Your, your experience with that in, uh, yeah. Um, Honestly, that was a crazy time because like I'm I'm not in the band, but I'm always uh working with them and like the uh the MD Adam Blackstone with just arrangements and pre-recording certain auxiliary keyboard parts and different transitions and stuff and dance breaks. So during that time, they were putting the Super Bowl show together and rehearsing that. <clears throat> And also putting the show together for the Man in the Woods tour, all yeah, at the same I, time. Yeah, and I saw I saw that I went to they were at Nationwide Arena here in Columbus. Mm -hmm. I went and saw that a few years ago. That was killing. Yeah, it was it was crazy because like to be channeling those because sonically Man in the Woods is completely different from the stuff from the Super Bowl. So it's like how. How do you go from trying to turn these greatest hits down from, cause the show before that, the tour before that was like a three hour show. Mm -hmm. So to condense all of that into 14 minutes, 12 minutes or whatever it was, like just that preparation and just those thoughts were crazy. Just how to weave in from different songs and what part actually needs to be heard or performed from this song it's like you might miss out on your favorite part of the song but we just don't have the time uh, so that was a battle and then just you know it was like I was for the Men in the Woods tour like each arranger and programmer would get like two or three songs and we would all just come together and put our songs together and like all right let's make this a tour so to do all of that and to do Super Bowl at the same time was was pretty crazy, but I mean that band is so good, like it's just mm -hmm. like oh this part it's almost like JT is one of those shows where it's like there's different parts and sections of the show that is, it it became a language, so we could be working with a whole other artist and then Adam could just say like you know oh like that one thing we did and then I know exactly what he's talking about even though it won't be mm -hmm. the same thing you understand the feeling that it's supposed to come from. Right. So it's, it's, it was a very, very fun experience. It was very cold as well. Cause we we're in Minneapolis. Um, and 
you just don't even want to go outside. I mean, Michigan gets cold, but like, man, wintertime in Minnesota is just, it, it makes you want to cry. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be careful crying because your, because your uh, tears will freeze. <laughs> yeah. So no, it, it was a, it was a fun experience just to, you know, see how it's done and just see how much preparation goes into those performances where they have the, you know, you got hundreds of dancers and you got a marching band and all this yeah. stuff. And it's like, <clears throat> just to even see them bring out the stage in that short amount of time, it's just like, man, this is really well thought out. Um, but it was an amazing experience. Hopefully, Lord willing, that I'll be on stage for one of the Super Bowls in the future. And if not, it's cool, too. But like it was it was a lot of fun to help help out with that show. Yeah, man. Um, I, I'll tell you, I I pay attention to the way that band leaders interact with and share the spotlight. You know, and JT seems like uh, he seems m more like a genuine person that just enjoys what he does and he's so then therefore he's also willing to sort of share the spotlight because in that for instance um uh uh i'm sorry in in the woods um man in the woods man in the woods sorry M man in the woods tour i mean in that show you know he didn't have to feature the background singers I mean, and, and who does that? Like, I, I can't think of many artists that are like, okay, hey, here's your, this is your turn now. You, you not, you're the not recently. I mean, back in the nineties, eighties, yeah, nineties, right. yeah, like R and B. Right, right. I, yeah, I, I. That's not that's not something that that I've seen a big pop star do. That it, that's it just doesn't happen. No, um, right. And so when I saw that, and he shared it with a few of the singers and they can sing, you know, of course, of course they can sing, you know, this is like the biggest tour in the world. Right. I mean, you're not going to get lousy people. Um, and, uh, of course the band is killing the whole, the whole production thing. Um, and, uh, I, I, uh, I've got a band at Ohio state called the Ohio show band. And it's, com it's a commercial music ensemble. And basically what we do is we design a tour quality show and oh, that's all we're doing for the whole every rehearsal and everything writing all the music all the arrangements all of the transitions all the automated automated stuff i'm using ableton live you know okay. cues clicks everything uh, the, the whole thing is there i mean there's there's canned orchestra the, you know the other guitar part on stuff i mean it's all kinds of stuff and um um synced video uh automated lighting dancers everything the, the, i mean it's the it's the it's the whole thing i mean like we did um what 28 songs wow yeah i mean it's just and it's bang 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 you know and then it's you know we'll do like seven songs in a row and then there's like an automated sort of interact with the audience kind of thing but it's everything set it's on a timeline yeah. so <laughs> you know um and so seeing a show done that well like the super bowl show you know like man in the woods um i think if people think that i think sometimes people have a certain assessment of uh you know of the arts you know, it's like, well, if it's pop, then that means it's can't be as slick as like, um, you know, high art music or, you know, like as like, you know, the major classical works or as, you know, aspects of jazz or something like that. But not only do I think that that is total hogwash, but there's this this other element that is just totally ridiculous just all the time it takes to automate and control 
all every aspect of the show. It's not just the music. It's a show, right? So that part of it is just, um, it. I mean, it. <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it, but j just to see how well those shows go, and and to understand what it takes to make a show <laughs> come off like that, it's it's really incredible. Yeah, it's it's crazy too because it's like most people they don't see that part of the preparation and they also don't even see the mistakes. It's like, they could think the show was killing and perfect and people be back there yelling and screaming at each other. Like what happened? And it's like, you just, it's a, it, once you start doing that, you have another appreciation for it. And you realize like, I mean, I know you're a perfectionist. So it's like, it, it just tunes your mind and heightens your senses of wanting to be perfect. And it's, it, it drives you crazy because it will never be just completely perfect, but you just strive every night to make it the best it can be. Now, you know, I was thinking about another time uh, that I saw you. Um, actually, we saw each other in person because I was out in Anaheim mm -hmm. for the NAM show. Um, and, uh, and then we, get, we, we got together and got something to eat and it was a bunch of us, right? Uh, was Raphael there for that? I feel like he was. Yeah, and Jevin was there. Yeah. And uh, Joe. Yeah. It was like a bunch of us, like a bunch of Kalamazoo cats. <laughs> it took forever to find somewhere to eat, too, man. It was so That's bad. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And then when we found a place, we still had to wait for a, like an hour or something to get in. Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't even matter because, I mean, you know, the food was an excuse to hang out, right? So it yeah. was like, eh, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm proud of uh, all of us, man. We we're doing stuff, man. It's it's yep. really cool to see. Getting it in, man. This music thing, it gets in you, and uh, you know, I I I tell, you know, I'm in the business of recruiting students, you know, for uh, for Ohio State. And it used to be that there were enough, there was enough work um, that if you had a student that maybe they didn't, they had, didn't have the most natural ability, you know, but they were a hard worker, you know, I would take those students without even thinking about it. Because I knew that I could get them on a program that would get them to a certain level. Mm -hmm. But because there are so many super talented musicians in the world, and because actually the opportunities to actually play, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about, I mean, the music industry is huge. I mean, there's like a billion jobs in the music industry, different kinds of jobs, you know. So I'm not necessarily t uh, 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 talking about that. I'm talking about someone that wants to play. Say, hey, you know, I want to. I all I want to do is just play my instrument for a living. There's so many great players, and there are so few opportunities now. If that's the only thing that you can do, right? And so, what I try to tell my students is, look, your instrument might be your gateway. That might be what you kind of get you in the door. But once you get in the door, you got to be able to do all of this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, pro, you know, uh, you, you need to have a recording studio, you know, you need to, you know, you need your, know your way around, uh, a DAW, whatever DAW of your choice, but probably should be, uh, what logic pro tools, <laughs> you know, probably one of those. Um, I mean, you, 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 and, and now you have to have your video game together. You know, you got to have, <laughs> well, you, you thought you were a saxophone player, but you really need to be developing some keyboard chops, mm -hmm. right? Um, Cause you want to be able to facilitate your writing. You know, you need to be able to arrange for anything 
doesn't matter what it is orchestra marching band you know church choir you know you, you just I mean, because when when the jobs come you got to be able to say yes right yeah and i, w- I want to hear from you like w- what have been uh because you've had a lot of different experiences in music and i'm sure that many of the experiences that you had you said yes to stuff that maybe it wasn't something that you had done before. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, it's more of like, uh, I think the craziest one for me was like, um, was working with this, uh, this rapper and she was said, just come on to the scene and basically never, she went viral. And like a art, like a label picked her up, but she had never performed before in her life. So they had been recording these songs with like different producers and writers in LA. And I thought that I was just coming in and you know, putting some show tracks together, and and just give them a few two mixes and be on my way. I'm like, no, I'm over here performance coaching and showing her how to hold the mic. Pre- like correctly and like okay this part in the song like you're running out of breath so let's put the leads back in on this section so you can catch your breath and then be ready for the next section and the next couple of bars and like different things and like figuring out singing moments and live auto tune and all these things and it's like i had no idea that i was like running the rehearsal to help an artist learn how to perform so i think that was the craziest thing for me because i i mean I don't know how to be an artist and perform like that. Like, I'm just trying to play keys or like be an MD or all that. Or goose. And I'm just like, okay, this is But here. you had like, been around it, but you had been around it for so long and seen so much of it that. Yeah. You I mean, it you, out. Do, you do the best you can, but it was like that was. It was not in the in the job description. <laughs> and then you show up and that's just what it is. Just make it happen. So that's right. It was like it was cool, and there wasn't a lot of pressure, so that made it nice. But it was just like, man, this is hilarious. Like, <laughs> but it, it was it was a learning experience, and it's it's definitely helped with other artists that are newer. It's kind of, I mean, it's happening a lot now. Like a lot of these kids are going viral, and you know, it's just like, all right, well, let's put out a song, and it's like mm-hmm. never performed before, never recorded before, but if the song is good enough. It's like, okay, you're an artist now. Like, all right, now there's a tour. All right, now we got to be on TV. So they're under so much more pressure now because it's like, it's not just, you know, back in the day where you just, you know, perfect your craft and be as good as you can on your instrument or your voice. And that's it. Go up and do it and just be really good. Now it's right. like, you got to deal with the social aspect. You got to deal with fans, and haters, comments and controversy and cancel culture and like oh it's it's really become a lifestyle like it's oh like yeah I, you, you yeah and you said a big one there uh that yeah. cancel culture thing that's 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 a that's a tough one um yeah you're not really you know, allowed to make mistakes right 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 and uh, you know the social media thing um so so okay so if social media wasn't bad enough, like as far as like proliferation of information, just stuff just getting everywhere instantly, you know, the most embarrassing thing you ever did, everybody on earth knows about it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so not only do you have that, you have it coupled with certain very strong political forces that have decided on how they want to push the culture which direction they want the culture to move in and then if you're not moving in that direction you you get caught you can get caught in you get caught in the transition you get get caught in (laughs) you know the gears of this big machine and Mm -hmm. the machine don't care about you it just grinds you up right yeah um and then now everybody on earth knows that you're canceled And so now what are you supposed to do? So you spend all of this time developing something, developing a career, developing a life. What it is that you're doing 
is paying the bills. So for, you know, you're, you're taking care of your family and stuff with this. And then from that to go from hero to zero overnight is, uh, that's tough. Yeah. So that's it's tough. It's almost like people like artists like Daft Punk and other people like that, where you just never know who they are. It's, it's becoming more and more genius every day. It's like, right. it's like, you can't, you can't get a racist remark from a helmet. <laughs> like right. it's just, it just, you just put out your music and you go home. You're just anonymous. But it's like, that is, that was probably the best thing they could have ever done. Nobody cared if they were attractive or, they could have just been slobs, but like the music is so good, you rock with it. But it's just, just normal guys. It's scary. And yeah, yeah. Um, and especially for, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and there are certain, and I'm in, and I'm what you would consider traditional. You know, so. Oh, you know, so I, so basically what I'm saying is I believe the Bible, mm -hmm. right? And there's, you know, there's some stuff in there that is not, you know, that's not uh, politically correct. And um, if you, I, I remember, let's see, what, what was it? Uh, what's the name of those? Um, not, I'm forgetting um i i can't remember their name now but they had a uh they all have like they have beards and stuff and they this is if, this is you're probably not going to be able to <laughs> to understand what i'm what i'm saying now this is not gonna it's probably not gonna help very much but somebody that's listening might know who i'm talking about um Uh, but it was like a reality TV show and uh, one of the main guys that was on this and it's about a family um, was it he Amish quoted, in the city? no it wasn't that but he quoted some scripture it's, it's just some stuff out the bible and this was, this was I don't know this was probably seven or eight years ago or something like that hmm and he quotes some scripture and it's some scripture that had to do with you know some of the the uh um you know the gay rights agenda that the, that that whole thing it was like kind of right in the middle of the, a lot of that kind of stuff and so he said the stuff that he said and was just quoting the bible and they were trying to cancel him now this 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 was before a lot of the heavy heavy canceling was was going on this is before me too right see not because now you can get me too too and that's i'll tell you man that is really scary that is frightening stuff that you are supposed to just believe someone because they said something believe all women right you supposed to just believe what they said i know too many i know too many situations where they're not telling the truth i'm just that's all i'm saying that's that's <laughs> tough though man because like yeah there are some people that are not telling the truth to get ahead but then there are a lot of instances where they are and there's a lot of different people that are higher up that it's like you had to give something to get something and right. that is and that is real like those yeah, type it, of favors so, so are like the real. like the like the casting couch uh, Weinstein or whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, see here's, but here's the thing that's like so disingenuous about the, the whole, this whole thing. Um, everybody knew about the casting couch. Everybody knew about Weinstein way before any of the me too stuff. Everybody knew it. There was making jokes. Comedians were making jokes about it. There's a family guy episode an old family guy episode where they're, where they're poking fun at it. And then when it was um, convenient for them, then they're like, okay, now it's time to throw this. Up. We're going to act like we didn't know this. We're going to act like this is not our friend anymore. Like now this know? is not right. Yeah. Right. See, it's, yeah. it, 
it, to me, it's not an issue of, you know, if if someone has done something wrong, you know, yeah, I mean, it's nice, you know, to get a second shot, but if somebody's actually done something wrong, that's one thing. But if they just decide that now it's time for them to act like, you know, to act like they didn't know about it, that's the part that just makes me, um, it, yeah. it, it causes me to be very skeptical about what's actually going on and what the actual values are. Do you really care about this or or is there some other agenda that you're really more concerned about? Because everybody knew about the casting couch. I mean, so that that dude should have been out way, a long time ago. Um, uh, same thing with what, what's this guy uh, Epstein or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, everybody knew about this cat. Yeah, but he had his he had his hand in so many different pockets, and it's like, mm -hmm. like he was helping people make money, but he also was like blackmailing them at the same time. Yeah, like it's just. Is some people are just you know how back when they had the whole economic crisis and like banks and stuff and the bailouts and they're like they're too big to fail, right, right, right. That's how some people are in show business, and it's like there, there's some parts of show business where there are no morals, there are no standards. It's just like oh, yeah. survive. Um. So and it's unfortunate, but it's just the way it is. And I mean, I'm a Christian too, and it's like, I. I have to pick and choose my battles and it's like, I can't, I have to pick and choose when there's the best time to minister and be a light. And other times right. you just got to let people live their life because that's not what you're there to do. You're there to do a job. So right. as long as the job doesn't conflict with your own personal beliefs and your own stuff. And I mean, that's tough as well because it's like, sometimes you could be working at a church and the church is, doing stuff that's not in the right right right, so, right and right. it's like it's realizing now more that there's a lot of people that have been hurt by the church in the past because of just um just egos and like basically coming up with their own doctrine like yep and it's like this is how i want to run my church and it's like when you think about it now that's how we have so many de different denominations and different sub religions in a religion and it's like no, it's, this no. this thing is everywhere, man. Man is is imperfect. And so you, you really have to know God for yourself. But for me, just being out here in LA and in entertainment, it's like you really it's shown even more now that you have to know God for yourself and just be be ready to stand up for what you believe in and just try to do that with also trying to love everybody, whoever they are, wherever they came from, the best That's you right. can. That's a good word right there, man. That's a good word. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm a tenured professor at Ohio State. And if you want to talk about a place that is um, pushing the envelope with respect to all kinds of alternatives, you know, uh, uh definitely that's that's ohio state um and if you want to talk about a place that is hyper political there's so much politics uh politics governing all kinds of all kind of crazy stuff it's it's just it's just so hyper political it's a lot of people fighting over well whenever you have an institution that is as big as powerful and has the sort of successful sports programs mm -hmm. that Ohio State has that means that there's a lot of money and whenever there's a lot of money um, then then you're going to see more intense politics and more clever strategies at trying to you know get some of that to be able to sequester some of that money get that get mm -hmm. that money shifted over to what you're doing you know and uh, unfortunately, uh, with an institution, you know, like you know, like a university, which is not really supposed to be about 
that sort of thing, right? It's supposed to be about higher learning and all of these lofty ideals. You find that you're still sort of in the same situation, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to throw Ohio State under the bus or anything. This is this is this is human nature, right? Uh, you know, um, and when I talk to my colleagues around the country, you know, everyone's facing different degrees of the same sorts of things. Um, so yeah, that that whole people thing, interacting with people, it's uh, it can be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> whoever knew like equality would be so hard why is equality so hard like it shouldn't uh -huh. be it's just it's like the most basic concept and it's just people are just fight like clawing and fighting just to not have that and it's like i don't know it's it's crazy to see and i can only imagine at a place like that where you're dealing with like you know sports sales and like tv deals and Right. all that sponsorships and it's like man you never know who the ceo is it's like or who anybody else is they could be a certain you know orient sexual orientation or a certain race or something it's like one person a football coach could say something and then that makes the the ceo of nbc mad and it's like all right the deal is off and it's mm -hmm. like even then it's just it's just there's so many things and it's like can we just go to school can we just play sports can we just... yeah yeah you know I, I i you know the the whole grace thing you know just you know i don't i don't say things with surgical precision all the time and and maybe i i say things that somebody would be outright offended by but that's 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 not a it's called free speech it's not a reason for you to try to cancel me. Um, I'm sure you say things that I don't like too, or, you know, so, so what, that doesn't matter. We can be individuals and we can have conversations and we can disagree and we can disagree, uh, vehemently and that's okay. That's, that's fine. It, the, the problem is when folks try to step over that line where it's like, okay, well, I don't like what they said and because that I'm going to do something to you now. I'm going to take something away from you because I don't like how you said that. And obviously if you're, if you're saying stuff that is, um, you know, hate speech or something. Yeah. Um, if it's, but of course that, that has become stretched to include a bunch of stuff that actually isn't hate speech. But if it actually is something that is hate speech, then obviously you shouldn't be saying it, you know? Um, but I don't know. But that, it's a that's the mess. problem though, because like a lot of people are using hate speech and they're like free speech. Like, and it depends on like, if you're in a private institution or a public institution. And I mean, Right. America is just such a crazy place already because, you know, we can move to it certain places in Europe and it's like hate speech is straight up illegal. So mm -hmm. it's just like you say that around the wrong, the wrong place, you're going to get arrested and you may not be able to get back home. Nobody's going to be able to save. You. Um, so it's <clears throat> it's a double edged sword. And it's I think it's just such a this time. It's just such a crazy time. Like, like you said, it's it's hard to have conversations and disagree with people respectfully. Yeah. Um, even on tour, it's like, okay, I could be touring with somebody. What if my band made a Trump supporter? It's like, okay, that's that's him. That's on him. Like, I shouldn't hate him because of that or say right, hateful right. things to him because of that. That's just who he's going for. Right. Like. And it's just to the point where it's like, now you, if you support one person, like, you must not like me or people who look like me. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I just don't, I really hope that these next few years that like just people could respect each other's opinions and have 
whatever they believe and just respect it and treat others with respect if they don't dis- if they disagree like yeah. it's, it's not that hard but you know it's the world we live in right now yeah it it does seem like there's it does seem like it would be easier than this yeah. <laughs> it does and seem it's like all effect it's all affecting music too which makes it even worse because it's like man I'm not here for the politics. Like I'm trying to make people dance. Yeah, like, right, right, right. I'm trying to change lives, and it's like we just always have to take a stand and all of this stuff and just play nice. And it, it's it's unfortunate, but it's like, yeah, you got to stand up for what's right, but let's not lose the fact of why we're here. Right. 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 All right, man. Well, d- d- tell me, tell me about uh, maybe something current that you're working on, uh, and or if there's something that you want to plug. Um, that's tough. I mean, right now it's Grammy season, so working on a couple performances for that. So that'll be fun. Mm. Um, um, what else? Got a virtual show coming up with Charlie Puth at the end of March. So that'd be fun because I haven't played with those guys in a while. Um, but yeah, besides that, I've just been producing and arranging at home. If anybody needs a song done, hit me. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, I want to collaborate with you on something. We'll, we'll have to talk about it. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, but what I'll do is in the description to this video, I'll put, you know, uh, your like your social media so people can get can get to you. Yeah. Um, and uh, how, you, you are you good with your DMs? Yeah, yeah. It's it's mm-hmm. crazy too because people hit me just random people and just you know give a compliment or shout me out or and then like I'll respond and like I can't believe you respond. It's like you guys must not know where Matt, Kalamazoo, Michigan is. <laughs> Like, <laughs> uh, no matter what artist I'm playing for, if I'm standing next to a superstar or something, I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Mm. Like, people don't make it out of there. So mm. every day that I get to do this, every day I get to be on a late night TV show or a morning show or even just play at a random picnic, like, it's a blessing. Mm. So anybody who hits me up, I will respond. That's great, man. Well, God bless you, man. I've I uh, I've enjoyed our conversation, being able to catch up a little bit, um, and uh, gonna have to do a better job of uh, staying in touch with you offline. Likewise, man. Likewise. All right, man. Well, God bless you. Have a good one. God bless you. You too. Bye.